Oh, listen, uh, let's go ahead and bring Colonel McGregor in. I know he's got a limited amount of time tonight. I don't want to miss any minute with him. He is obviously uh, in the fight, has been in the fight for a long time, extremely knowledgeable. And I don't want to short the owners. Of course, his right. bio. He's a decorated combat veteran and author of five books, a PhD and a defense foreign policy consultant. He was commissioned in the regular army in 76 after one year at VMI and four years at West Point. 2004, McGregor retired with the rank of colonel in 2020. The president appointed McGregor to serve as senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, a post he held until President Trump left office. He holds an MA in comparative politics and a PhD in international relations from the University of Virginia. Uh, he's widely known inside the US, Europe, Israel, Russia, China, and Korea for both his leadership in the Battle of 73 Easting, the US Army's largest tank battle since World War II, and for his groundbreaking books on military transfer Transformation, uh, breaking the phalanx and transformation under fire. McGregor's recommendations for change in force and design integrated all arms, all effects operations, profoundly influenced force deployment in Israel, Russia, and China. He has done so much. Is really, I, I'd rather have him talk about it. His bio goes on and on and on. This is a real combat veteran, real experience. And I've got to tell you, I've been watching his interviews. He truly understands what it takes to be president of the United States, and he recognizes the need for a multi-point kind of plan for how presidents actually deal in the country. And of course, his big plan is uh, uh, obviously unifying and not dividing, because we know that division and chaos is a tool of the left. George, let's go ahead and bring him in. All right. Welcome to the Big Big Show, Colonel Douglas McGregor. How you doing, sir? Fine. Thanks, George. You know, we thanks really for the nice introduction. Well, I've got to tell you, your resume goes on and on and on. <laughs> Obviously, if I could make my short list, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up your skirt, uh, if I could make my short list of people that I hope Donald Trump is bringing into his cabinet, uh, you're obviously on my list. Uh, Michael Flynn, uh, General Brigadier Anthony Tata, Cash Patel, uh, Dan Scavino. Uh, <laughs> I, there's a lot of people that were in that first round that I did not trust. You are not one of them. Uh, you're one of the people that I always thought always had the best interest of the country, God, country, family, and always made the effort to go above and beyond, sir. Well, thanks. I, I think we tried. And uh, unfortunately, I see some of the bad apples that uh, we saw the last time showing back up again yes. uh, near Donald Trump. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I have great affection for the president. And I've always felt strongly that if he follows his gut instincts, he'll be fine. The problem is that he was always surrounded by lots of people that did everything they could to distract him from doing what he thought was right. Mm. Yeah. You know, ethically, he has a long history of always doing the right thing. Uh, obviously, the judicial system has been weaponized against him, but uh, his reputation has always been stellar. Uh, some of the circles I ran in New York mm. knew him uh, personally, and they always had positive things to say about him as far as the way he operated on a day-to-day -day way of life. Of course, that's not what the media has done. They've done an amazing job in undermining and attacking him. Uh, you know, I mean, you spent well, a lot of time about him. Who to the mainstream him. media? You know, good Lord. Well, yeah. people yeah. like him. Exactly. People, you're people you're live in, like, Vermont. That. People that, like, live in Vermont, maybe, or Washington <laughs> State. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, you got. We might as well start lining up those states. You know, the two coasts. But I have a question for you. So when, and I'm going to say, when Trump wins, would you take a position in the um in the administration? Well, obviously, any time a president of the United States asks you to serve, your predisposition is to say yes. I mean, it's an honor to serve in in, in an administration, and would be a particular honor to serve under Donald Trump. But that depends on a lot of things that, uh, you know, we can't possibly forecast right now. Right. Yeah. You know, the the collusion and, uh, you know, the uh, what they're doing, the, obviously, we don't have a free and fair election system currently. They've done an amazing job of, you know, obviously controlling the narrative, uh, whether it's on social media or whether it's mainstream media, it comes down from the top to bottom. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because obviously, you're, you were never part of this ideology, but a lot of people around the United States are concerned about this woke DEI ideology that's in our military currently. And we feel like they've really undermined our, you know, our tactical ability because of what they have promoted inside of the military. Got any thoughts on that? Well, it's obviously you're right. Uh, it's, it didn't just begin with DEI. We've had a problem with this off and on for decades. 
you know that uh, Richard Nixon implemented affirmative action as a temporary measure. But like so many other things that start out as being temporary in Washington, they suddenly become a, a permanent benefit, an unearned benefit, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was always uh, something that large numbers of, of soldiers, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, warrant officers did not like. And uh, I think you have to really approach the military from a, to the extent that you're able, and you can never do it completely. But you want to approach everything from the standpoint of uh, bureaucratic promotion. In other words, it has to be based on demonstrated character, competence, and intelligence. It doesn't matter what your racial background is or whatever your sexual proclivities might be. And unfortunately, we've, we've now strayed far, far from that. And again, you know, you're never going to get completely rid of cronyism. You always have uh, four stars, sons, four stars, son-in-laws, and so forth and so on. That they they turn up repeatedly like bad pennies, and there's there's not a great deal that you can do to completely erase it. But mm -hmm. uh, it, we need to get back to the eighty percent solution that we had while I was on active duty, which is better than what we have now. And right, we have now, as you know, is uh, catastrophic. And when you have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs announce that we have too many white pilots and everybody everybody smiles and says, oh, I guess that's a legitimate concern. You got a problem uh, because no one should be concerned about what racial makeup the pilot happens to be. Uh, it should be whether or not the pilot is competent and gets the job done. As I like to point out, I don't remember anybody <clears throat> during the Second World War, Korea or Vietnam complaining about uh, too many white pilots. Uh, so I I find that whole whole approach offensive and stupid. Agreed. Yeah, it, it, you know, and not having the the best to serve and obviously the uh, the perfect capacity for each of them. You know, preparedness has always been uh, one of the strong suits. It seems at least of the U.S. military, at least what we've seen on this side of it. Um, but the, globally, it's 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 frightening, right? I mean, there's so much kinetic activity. The, uh, I don't I don't agree with uh, what's going on in Ukraine. I feel like a lot of it was a money laundering operation. I don't know. What are your thoughts on Ukraine? Because for a lot of the public, we see things and hear things that don't seem to match with what the government is telling us. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that most of what passes for threat assessments uh, is not very good. And uh, inflating the threat is very important to maintaining this bloated defense budget. And right now you're spending over a trillion dollars a year on national defense. Mm -hmm. That's incomprehensible. You know, we can't get our heads around that. We have no idea where all the money goes. We can't even audit the Department of Defense. And every time somebody tries <clears throat> and there's an attempt to uh, impose some accountability, they are defeated in the attempt. And the argument is, well, we have to keep the money flowing. Well, we've been keeping a lot of money flowing in a lot of directions that are bad directions. You end up building a lot of the wrong material, investing in the wrong equipment, undervaluing human capital and uh, training. You know, we don't recruit very effectively. Uh, there, there are so many problems. It, it could go on and on and on. It seems to have just gotten worse. I left the Army in 2004. Things weren't really very good at that point. Things had already begun to deteriorate. Uh, because of these unnecessary occupations in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, why the hell would you want to occupy any of these places? It doesn't make any sense. Mm. And the notion that you're going to transform the people that live there into good little Anglo-Saxon Democrats is, was, of course, absurd. Never made any sense. And nobody ever bothered to raise the question, well, wait a minute, what right do we have to dictate how these people should live? What sort of political culture they should have? And so forth and so on. But we, we've been down this road before. We went down it in Vietnam, and uh, that worked brilliantly, you know. <laughs> and if you go back and look at the Vietnam War, it's very difficult to uh, find a reason why we ever needed to go to begin with. And if you listen to all the people that were involved, the first comment they say is, well, you know, we really didn't understand the culture. We didn't really know what we were getting into. I listened to uh, <clears throat> General Jack Keane make that same statement. Well, if you didn't know what you were getting into, it's because you chose not to listen to the people that did know what you were getting into. Mm -hmm. Because there were lots of people, and I was still on active duty, and I helped to uh, plan it uh, back in uh, 2002 and 2003, the advance on Baghdad. And there were lots of people that understood, whatever you do, you don't want to stay in this place. You want to go in, you want to remove the government, 
which basically meant Saddam and his friends, and put in another bunch of generals, tell them to get on with things, invite the UN to come in and muck around as much as necessary, but then get out, stay out. Yeah, I, I didn't run into anybody in uniform at that point in 2003 that didn't understand that staying there was a mistake. So uh, there's an awful lot of deception and uh, deceit that goes on. Uh, and they act like, well, you know, we just didn't know. Well, I think they did, but they chose to do what was wrong anyway for various reasons. And then look at the people that became wealthy. I can put you in a car and drive you around uh, McLean, Virginia, Great Falls, Virginia, Potomac, Maryland, and find out who lives in all these magnificent mansions, all these retired four stars and three stars and SESs and, you know, congressmen and bureaucrats. I mean, it's the, the seven richest counties in the United States surround Washington, D.C. Come on, wake up, smell the coffee. You know, this is a, this is graft on a scale that we have never seen in the history of the United States. And by the way, we've had plenty of graft. I mean, you go back to the Civil War, we went through a lot of crap over corruption. It was terrible. And it, it persisted afterwards, but it was on a very modest level compared with what you have going on in Washington today. So if you step forward and say, no, wait a minute, uh, as, Je as uh, President Trump just said very recently, in fact, I sent out a tweet, you know, paying tribute to President Trump because he said, you know, the Russians and the Chinese really aren't our enemies. And I can deal with them. We we can we can make things work. We can do business. Well, no kidding. He's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And that got I think 1.3 million views. I said this this is exactly right, and he he should get the next Nobel Peace Prize. Put an end to all this nonsense. But if you do that inside the Beltway, you're going to be crucified yeah. because you absolutely must have all these ridiculous uh, threats. And and again, the other thing is that. Everybody pays lip service to, well, you know, warfare has changed. Yeah, warfare is always changing, but the structure hasn't changed. We still do business the way we've always done business. We're still organized to refight World War II. We're still producing the same kinds of equipment since. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I mean, look at all your aircraft carrier battle groups. You know, there are really only two classes of ships in the United States Navy, because I worked for the Secretary of the Navy for a while. And that, that was back in 2007, 2008. You know what the two classes are? Uh, aircraft submarines, carriers. Submarines and targets. Oh, That's it. targets. <laughs> That's it. Come on. Yeah. We, just, uh, we just had a Russian sub that, that came up in the middle of one of our uh, carrier battle groups. That's not unusual. We've done the same thing to the Chinese. The Chinese have done it to us. You know, every time you hold a major exercise at sea that involves submarines and surface vessels, the whole thing ends when all the surface combatants are sunk. Mm. I mean, things have changed. You're damn right they have. Space-based surveillance is everything. You know, I was, in fact, I see you, you interviewed uh, Eric Prince. Mm. And I was with him and a group of uh, 70 of his best friends. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to come and speak at the end of an exercise that Eric was running out at his home in Middleburg, Virginia. And the thing I said to them that, that really sort of surprised certain people as I said, you realize that what we have today that's changed everything is this thing called persistent surveillance. You have so many different platforms in space, in the air. You have sensors in the sea, in the seabed, everywhere. You're not going to have a battle of the bulge. Do you understand? You're not going to have it. You can't get away with it. And that changes also the way you fight because as we've seen in Ukraine, once the Russians got organized, they set up a strategic defense, they built up their force, and what did they do? They linked all the overhead surveillance, intelligence, reconnaissance platforms with massive strike weapons, all sorts of artillery, rockets, missiles, tactical ballistic missiles. And what's happened? We have 600,000 dead Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what didn't they get? Well, they had brilliant advice from all these retired army generals and active duty army generals and Marines telling them how to fight the NATO way, according to NATO doctrine, 600,000 dead Ukrainian soldiers. We think the Russians may have had in the entire time frame 100,000 casualties, most of whom returned to active duty again. In other words, they didn't die of wounds. Sure. And the Ukrainians have had almost no means of evacuating severely wounded. That died out long ago because the infrastructure, the human and the capital infrastructure was destroyed. 
So you can't save people that are wounded on the battlefield. So what do they do? They die. You know, nobody tells the truth. Oh, Ukraine can still win? Yeah, well, I can raise Groucho Marx from the grave, too. You know, just hang around long enough and I'll do it for you nice. on, uh, you know, main main television. I mean, this is this is crazy. We need to learn from what we're watching right now because it does change things. And we got to get it. We got to get into the game. I don't think we are. What what happens is that people from Raytheon and Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and all these places, along with four stars and retired and active, walk in and say, "Congressman, we need to spend this money." Okay, two hundred billion will get us over the hump. Uh huh. What do you, what's in it for the two hundred billion? Where's it going? Where, where where does it show up? You know, we used to have this statement about uh, nothing's too good for the soldiers. And that's what they get. You know, I, I hate to be blunt. You know, when I was working for the no, Secretary you, the Navy, let me I tell you something. I think the American public wants blunt. I think that's why people appreciate you and several of the other names I ran by you before. It's because they want blunt. We're tired of the stories. I mean, the narratives control the military industrial complex is doing an incredible job of uh, obviously compromising our executive branch of government. Uh, they do a great job in, in, in obviously putting the money in the right spot so we continue to spend. And then, of course, the uh, once we give the contracts, the, uh, uh, the senators and congressmen have already bought the stock in advance, the puts, calls, and options. And, of course, the contracts go through. The congressional members get filthy rich. Dianne Feinstein, uh, $196 million net worth on a $6 million revenue, flying around in a paid-for $63 million jet. Nancy Pelosi the other day is smart enough to pull the trigger before the DOJ issues a complaint against Visa. Her husband, of course, her and her husband don't talk, and Nancy doesn't own any stock. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is going on and on and on. And, and well, I really wait a minute, believe wait a minute. it. I, I think you have to be a little more understanding towards Nancy. I mean, if you look at her husband, I'm not sure I'd bother talking to him either. Yeah, well, the <laughs> Crypt Keeper, you, you can't I think, blame I think the fire went out of that operation a long time ago. Yeah, George, George, what's your point? Why, what, well, why do you think they're still together? You the, said it today on our other still, show. They're still together, so one doesn't have to testify against the other. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, you would understand that with your background and experience in New Jersey, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah. Um, you, well, know, you know, the sad part is that the mafia was much more effective, always the old mafia, much more effective than the U.S. Armed Forces. They would go out to find the you. right people to eliminate and eliminate them, and, and they didn't have to kill 100 people to get it done. My, my godfather we're, we're was a capo for the Gambino, so I grew up around those guys as a young yeah. kid, saw a lot of it. I think behaviorally, they were a lot more ethical than what we're seeing in Washington, D.C. And by uh, the way, you can also make the argument that they were actually patriotic if you go back and look at Oh, their they were. You know, yeah, if you look, if you look go back, back at how they protected the docks at that time and the information yeah. they provided, and of yeah, course the operation to, that they're ready to assist with against Fidel Castro. Sure, sure. Well, you go back and look at people like uh, the original Rockefeller and Vanderbilt yeah. and, and all these people. They were very patriotic. They would never do anything to hurt the United States. Now they would, you know, sell each other's grandmother if it if it made sense for business. That's different, but they would not hurt America. You know. Mm. We don't have that. Anymore. And now we've got Alexander and George Soros, you know, uh, uh, we've got the, the WEF, the UN, we've got Klaus Schwab, Yuval Noah Harari, we've got all mm -hmm. kinds of people that seem to have their hand in the pie, and all of them have ill intent towards the country and its people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I, you know this is a, it's a strange, strange setting. I don't think it will last, but I do wish more Americans would come to the realization of just how bad it is. And part of the problem is because, you know, I I have two sons and uh, they both uh, get tired of listening to me for a mm -hmm. whole range of obvious reasons. But uh, one of the things they keep pointing out to me is, Dad, it's just not bad enough. You know, my oldest son, he likes to point out, when did the French Revolution break out? He said they did, they'd had bad, bad problems for decades. It didn't happen until the Paris population could not afford to buy bread. Mm hmm. Then there was a revolution. And his point is, until it gets worse and people are suffering in a demonstrable way, they're going to sit in the in the lounge chair, they're going to suck down their beer and watch cable TV and forget about it. I, I yeah. think he's got a point. 
I mean, I think it's a great point he's made. You know, it's, it's tough, uh, you know, I, but I do see this undertone. We spend a lot of time, obviously, investigating, looking for stories, sourcing stuff. So we're online constantly. We're looking all over the globe, though, not just here. We stay away from mainstream media. We use a lot of alt sources. But, you know, the general tone is that there's no accountability and consequences whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have the DOJ as an example. I have mentioned this on the show before. Here's a group that's that the only oversight for them, uh, they, 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 they laugh at Congress. They laugh at the subpoenas. They laugh at showing up and testifying. Of course, if you and I do that, we'd get it. We would be uh, we'd have a warrant issued immediately and have to serve time just like they did to Peter Navarro and they did to uh, Steve Bannon. But the point is no accountability. Of course, that's why, because the OIG is the is a, a DOJ division. That's oversight. OPR, Office of Professional Responsibility, oversight. PIN, Public Integrity Division, oversight. And all, another DOJ department, Civil Rights Division, DOJ department. And then you're left with the state bars that have no investigative ability. They're not DOJ, but they're ineffective. So, you know, what they're doing, it's a fully weaponized system, because I think this. When you have people that can get away with stuff, of course, it's like that bartender that steals. George knows this. We've said this. I've said this many times. Steals that first drink, gets away with it the first night. Second night, he steals two drinks from you. By the end of the month, you're paying his rent. And I believe that's what's happened in D.C. The lobbying, the dark money, the foreign money, the super PACs, the book deals. There's just so much corruption. I mean, we've talked about it. George, they should wear NASCAR jackets, right, with all the patches on it. That way we know where <laughs> they got the money from. A lot of them would be just say yeah. China. <laughs> well, I think your uh, I think your bartender is currently occupying at least one seat in Congress. That's right. She so. she she's taking a position, you know, but that's okay that's right. because she can do the splits. Yeah, and I think that was an important thing for her when it came to getting I, that job. I'm not going down that road. You're you're, you're <laughs> on dangerous ground now, you know. At the, back in the in the 1990s, we used to joke all the time that the only way that a that an army officer, as far as we could tell, almost anybody in the military could be relieved was not because you were an obvious idiot who could not command the unit, who could not maintain it, who could not train it effectively, could not lead it anywhere. No, that, that doesn't make any difference. You could have every major weapon system fail, every tank, every Bradley, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. The only way you could be relieved is that if you went and had sex on the, you know, the parade ground at noontime, <laughs> in front of God and all the world with somebody that you weren't married to. And that was about it. And, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of where we're stuck right now. People, you know, there's this unhealthy interest in everybody's sex life. I, I, wow. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but in the military, Nailed it. you know, these people would call in and say, well, I'm calling up. I want to tell you about Colonel so-and-so. I think he's sleeping with specialist Susie Dumbledore. The next thing you know, some fool over at the IG would say, General, we have a very important report we need to share with you. Who gives a shit? You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Was this woman raped? Or was it consensual? You know, and somebody says, well, it's immoral. Well, then take it up with the chaplain and his family. But we're paying all sorts of absurd attention to that nonsense. We don't look at anything that counts. It's outrageous. Don't you, don't you think that's the David Copperfield sleight of hand? It's kind of like the P. Diddy case. They weren't supposed to indict him. They, they said that they went weeks ahead of time for a number of reasons. I, you know, again, I could care less about the, the, the story itself. It's obviously an influence op, uh, just like Epstein was. We've seen that. We know that Weinstein was doing the same thing in his own way, maybe not as sophisticated as Epstein, because obviously uh, the, the technology that was in Epstein's houses was all Mossad-driven, Israeli-driven technology. So what that operation was with Ghislaine Maxwell. Her father obviously had connections with Mossad. Who knows? Maybe we'll never know. But the point is that I think those are all those operations come out and they're really they're a way to distract the American public from what's important. We should be all worried about the election. That's the only thing we should be worried about because we've got an idiot there running uh, on the Democratic side. And of course, they want to kill Trump. I saw you posted uh, about uh, the, the Sams have been smuggled into the country. I don't know where that intel came from. That's a hell of a story. I want to make sure we touch on that. But my point is, here we are with the with the, them controlling whether it's the 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 mainstream media right into because of course the story gets created by whoever. Let's say Deep State. Deep State creates a story. It goes to mainstream CNN, MSNBC, and all the other garbage stations. And then of course it trickles down to the paid social media influencers and all the other platforms: Daily Beast, Washington Post, and all the rest of the garbage. But that they're so good at it. 
because they're tricking the American public. Let's pay attention to that P. Diddy had a thousand bottles of baby oil, but let's not talk about the second attempt on Donald Trump's life. Let's not talk about that during the, the uh, obviously, the uh, you know, presidential debate, that Kamala Harris basically lied on nearly everything she mentioned, and most likely ABC gave her the questions. So it's a redirection, right? It's, a, it's an influence op. Well, I think we also need to understand that if P. Diddy had worked with the Mossad, he'd still be in business. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's probably, P. Diddy, well, P. Diddy did not handle that well. He didn't have the right business partners. He wasn't covered by the right intelligence agencies. I'm yeah. serious. I mean, Epstein has been around doing this stuff for years, yeah. years. And no one has ever seen the real client list. I just want to get to all those, uh, you know, videotapes and so identify everybody in Washington, D.C. who's on every videotape. I mean, you know, flying on that airplane, good God, what, who knows what went on in that place. But, you know, the, the thing is, you're right, it's a distraction, but it's also a reflection of our, our social decadence. You know, listen, we're, no one is ever a puritanical wonder child. We, we, all, we all make mistakes, we all engage in things, and I know that you two have done a lot, but we won't go there right now. But the point is, you know, we we have we have taken this position that that's more important than anything else. Mm. And so you can steal everybody blind. You can keep funding bad programs. You know, one of the things that I did when I was working with the Secretary of the Navy uh, was go back and look at the original requirements that were written for the various uh, programs of record. And those requirements, for the most part, were developed in the 80s. Hmm. And we were looking at this stuff in the first first 10 years, first decade of the 21st century. And they just went on and on and on because it was a feeding program. And everybody who was involved with the program knew that the, it was not a, a question of what did you produce with it. It's that you had to keep it going because it represented money, a stream of money that came in. And Congress wanted that stream because that stream went to donors and it went to constituents and it went to Navy yards and so forth. Those things need to be addressed, but the only way we're gonna get there, I think, is with bankruptcy. You're gonna to have to go through a serious financial crisis and some, somebody's gonna say, wait a minute, we, we can't afford it anymore. Then I think we might get somewhere. Now there's another way that you could you could get through this too. And I don't wanna see that happen. And that is that if we are severely embarrassed by a major military defeat that we can't conceal from the American public. Mm. Because you and I know Vietnam was a lost war. Oh, yeah. I'm tired of listening to all these people that say, well, we, we won every battle. Well, that's, first of all, that's crap, okay? You know, the same thing, we won every battle in Afghanistan, we won every battle, wait, wait a minute. It's a catastrophe. It was a huge failure, a strategic failure. A lot of people involved in that. Nobody will talk about it. Nobody will cover it. So everybody passes over it. Look at the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Everybody was upset with that disaster. And, you know, I love Donald Trump, but those generals that were responsible for that, he appointed them. They were his generals. Yeah. Oh, the Taliban the had violated their agreement. We didn't have to do the pullout like we did. We didn't have to operate. They'd already violated the terms of the initial agreement, correct? Listen, I mean, we, so we had Sarah Adams that, on the show. We should have been out of that country in six months. Yeah. Do you know Sarah Adams? Are you familiar with her CIA targeter? Really knowledgeable about Afghanistan. We had her on the show recently. Sarah She's Adams. No. Yeah, incredible no. resource. Unbelievable. She is highly knowledgeable. And even she talks about right now the unification of different terrorist organizations because of the way we pulled out. We're funding right now the Taliban at a tune of 40 to $87 million a week, allegedly supposed to be humanitarian aid because the, the Taliban decides where the money goes. Uh, they're obviously, they just asked, which is incredible, and I believe it's because of the relationship with China, they just asked to join BRICS, which of course... The, you know, 35 yeah. trillion in debt, fiat currency, and now we've got BRICS. Yeah. Uh, you can see it in the gold prices. All those countries are purchasing large amounts of gold. Oh, yeah. Obviously, they're going to have a gold-backed currency. Yeah. Uh, you, so you take a, a $35 trillion, you know, mar economy that's obviously a, a financial uh, development system that the U.S. is, mm -hmm. and there's no choice. I mean, BRICS probably likely 
is the winner when you compare those side by side. Now, again, I think it's going to take a little bit of time yet, but they've got so many countries asking to join. And the unification of these terrorist organizations, Hamas, ISIS, she was telling us about a guy that they abbreviated his name, very long name. I, I can't remember it, but Musa is what he goes by. And he's actually mm -hmm. the individual that was responsible for creating all the IDs, the fake identities for the Taliban, uh, you know, the, the group for the last 10 or 15 years. And yet he's not even on a target list for the CIA or the DIA or the DOD or any of the organizations here, which is pretty incredible that that she knows who it is and yet they don't have him in their sights and i think we had lieutenant general sami sadat obviously just wrote a book called the last commander great book he talks about that the, the our government the biden administration had been negotiating with the taliban for nearly two years prior to the bullet and when i say negotiating with them kind of giving them whatever they wanted uh it doesn't sound like any of the uh mm -hmm. ammunition even that was being bought that was supposed to go to coalition forces was even going to them they're walking around with you know 10 rounds of ammo you know maybe five rounds and and, and they have to try to engage well, you, and win. If you think that's bad it's much worse in ukraine the yeah. Ukrainians are reselling our weapons to all sorts of horrible people. Oh, yeah. oh, it's yeah. on the dark web. You can go buy yeah, them right we've now. Done, we've done investigation on the dark web, and we I have a source that deals, has been dealing with the cartels that I talk to once in a while. He's He's been a service guy for them for years, deals with all the organizations. And he said he went to a, a meeting that occurred between four of the leaders of the different cartels they've been organizing on how they divide up the, obviously, this, this windfall they've had at the border. And he said it looked like special forces. Uh, they had brand new uh, vehicles, uh, APVs from South Africa. They had uh, all kinds of military armament that looked like U.S. Uh, US uh, um, military, including the quad mono goggles, Harris well, radios. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. right now, our this administration just agreed to give Israel $8.7 billion, and they're giving Ukraine $8 billion. Mm. Almost like, it's almost $17 billion. So Where's this money coming from? Are you printing yeah, well, it? You know, I think a lot of it's being printed. The question is, where does it all go? And we know that a lot of it disappears into all sorts of bank accounts and black mm -hmm. holes. And, uh, you know, I think the only solution to most of this is to cut the money off. And that's what I was saying about bankruptcy. At yeah. some point, you just say, that's it. We're leaving. You pull the plug, you get out. You stop funding the stuff. But the other thing that you've got to do, which you were talking about by implication a little earlier, You've got to defend your own country. Mm. We're not defending the United States. We're not defending our borders. It's not just that. It's it's everything. You know, people talk to me all the time. Well, well those Chinese, you know, we need to bomb them. Uh, and I said, really? Uh, I said, is that going to solve the problem? Well, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you let them in. You let them into the United States. You let them into the laboratories. You let them into our manufacturing facilities. Mm -hmm. You let them into the universities. And then you stand here and say you're shocked that they're stealing everybody blind. I used to go over to Korea and Japan. I don't do that very much anymore. But when I was going over there, this is about, this would have been 14, 15 years ago, they would say, oh, uh, Colonel McGregor, uh, do you see any Chinese in our laboratories here? Do you see any Chinese uh, working in our stores here? So I said, no. They said, that is because we are not stupid. <laughs> <And> they, <laughs> They would then say, you know, that what the Chinese are doing, they've been doing for the last 2,000 years. It's nothing new. Everybody in Asia knows the game. Mm. What the hell is wrong with us? Well, we know because some fool in Congress stands up and says, well, that's racist. You can't do that. Yeah. Well, you know. Colonel, so normally I wouldn't do this, but out of respect for you, it's it's 741. I, I don't know if you need to go or you want to stay. Well, 45 is my drop dead time. All right. Okay. You'll see well, me just pass out in, in, in uh, another four minutes. I'm going to quickly just sum <laughs> this up. So we have sources inside the NFSC, New Federal State of China. We're close to them. They give us lots of intel. And I and, and, and everything they've said so far has turned out to be true. Uh, at the end of the day, they say there's eight different divisions of Chinese that have come into the country from eight different military divisions. Of course, uh, they're spread out across the country. They're staying in safe houses on a lot of the farmland, nest, obviously next to sensitive mm -hmm. military targets around the United States. We know about the weather balloons. I mean, this is some crazy stuff. You, you Common sense would tell you well, that nobody would do this if it wasn't intentional. It's not an well, accident. You, you mentioned mistake. the weather balloons. Yeah. They were weather balloons. Mm -hmm. You get it? 
There was no, the, the Chinese don't need a balloon to spy mm -hmm. on us. They have these yeah. things called satellites. Yeah, of course. And their technology is as good as theirs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard all this stuff about, well, these military age men. Well, I can tell you one thing that large numbers of them are wanted by the Chinese police authorities. Mm. And nobody ever bothers to bring that up. The Chinese have actually approached us and said, we'd like you to send a lot of these people back so we can we can prosecute them and jail them. Mm. China has a huge, huge problem with all sorts of corruption and criminality that flows from corruption. They're not a violent people, but they'll steal everything and they'll cheat and they'll lie and they'll misrepresent till the cows come home. Uh, I'm not really worried about that. What I'm much more concerned about is something you mentioned earlier. You talked about these surface-to-air missiles. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of Islamist elements inside the United States mm -hmm. from various countries. We don't know where they all are. We don't know what they've all got. But we also know that the drug cartels have cooperated with them. Mm -hmm. Now, the Chinese provide a lot of the ingredients for fentanyl and other drugs, which are all right. put together and cooked up in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But that's not personal. They do that anywhere they can. It has nothing to do with us. But the, the drug cartels are very, very closely aligned with organized crime, and they're very closely aligned with terrorism, mm -hmm. particularly Islamist terrorism. And I don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East, but I have been waiting around for terrible things to occur inside the country. Mm -hmm. And then everyone's going to be furious and say, well, how could this possibly happen? Yeah. And then you have to ask, where were you when somebody stood up and said, we have to close the border? Where were you when somebody said, halt immigration? Remember when Trump talked about stopping immigration? I think mm -hmm. he said something about shithole countries. Yes. A few other things like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know what? He was right. He's right. I no mean, he kidding. nailed it. I hate to be well, blunt, but that's the way it is. Did you it's see, true. Have you seen what El Salvador did, the president of El Salvador? We all know how bad that country was, rampant with uh, gangs. The president, president built the, these these prisons and all the gangs and murderers put them in there. Now it's beautiful, it's safe, it's thriving back again. Well, because so he had the guts to actually do something about it. Yeah. But I think that's harsh. I think that's inhuman. <laughs> and they need to have the opportunity to reform and rejoin society. Yeah. Every time I hear that, I want, I want just to give me a machine gun quickly. Well, you know, yeah. get rid of these people. It, yeah, you know, an industrial I mean, wood chipper could come in handy for that situation. Yeah. So look it's, at Maduro. Maduro emptied out his, his prisons and sent them all over here. And then we got like in, in Aurora, Colorado, they took over three apartment buildings in like New Jack City. Well, look at all the uh, young women that have been raped and murdered, gang raped in public and everything else. They get on the cell phone and call all their friends to come over. Uh, this sort of thing, it shouldn't happen, but it's going on. And we're not the only ones. You go to Western Europe, you see the same stupidity in yeah. Sweden, France, mm -hmm. and England. Germany's very at bad. Least Maloney, at least Maloney now is saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore, and is trying to crack down. But this, this, this is insanity. We are on a path to suicide. We've been on it for a long time. But fighting all of, in all of these places that, frankly, are of marginal interest to us is not the answer. We need to bring forces back. First of all, we need to retrench. We need to. We really need to change our recruiting. Uh, yeah. we, we've got to get much better people in than we're getting. We still get good people. Don't get me wrong, but we need a. You know, I, I try to tell people all the time. You know, the best soldier is smart, intelligent. The less you have to tell him what to do, the better soldier he is. And I've actually had people say, "I thought you just wanted to have people that did what they were told." Well, I mean, it's just it's absurd. Yeah, we, we we have a lot of things that we need to change, but the first thing we've got to do, is we've got to get control of our own country. And you know something, and, and I got to go, but this is something you guys really ought to explore with your other guests. Mm -hmm. Once we close these borders, it will happen. We shut it down. It's going to happen. And we stop immigration because it has to happen. We have over 52 million people inside this country that weren't even born here. Mm -hmm. And that's that's an estimate. There's probably more. So we're going to have to shut all this down. When that happens, you're going to cut off the drug cartels from a lot of income. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a war inside this country. And it's not just going to be in big cities. It's going to be all over the country. I never hear anybody talk about being prepared to fight that because it's going to take more than the, you know, Andy Griffith and, and company to fight it in the local police establishment. Mm-hmm.
Mm-hmm. But we're headed down that road, too. We've got to restore the rule of law. Everything has to start here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's really well said. Well, listen, we appreciate the time you gave us. We don't want to hold you up and then have, you know, happy life, happy, happy wife, happy life. Well, Lance, we'll just cut it down. We'll just cut it off and we'll just close it out. Yeah. So, so listen, we're going to see you at Rescue the Republic. Stop by yep. the booth. We'll be there with Rumble. We're excited to be there. Of course, that's this weekend. If you guys like the show, take the short form, the long form. Obviously, do anything you want. We're not going to come after you. We want to expand, unify the country through an education. Uh, Colonel McGregor, thank you so very much, sir, for joining us. We appreciate it. Definitely want to have you back on whenever you feel like it. We'd love to have you on the radio show also. We've well, got thank a big you radio show much. we do. So thank you, sir. You have a great night. Y'all, hold on, Colonel. Y'all have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow in D.C. We'll be doing our show. Colonel McGregor, please pass my regards to Mrs. McGregor for keeping you late. I apologize. We apologize. Yeah, I'll tell her that you're a very handsome guy and she needs to meet you. <laughs> All right. Whatever it takes, nice sir. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> okay.